Good morning and welcome to Teddy Talks for today, April 28th, coming to you live from Medora, North Dakota. Perhaps you'll uh, watch or listen later on Spotify or YouTube. That's a way that those of you who watch live can recommend it for your friends. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, and uh, today we have a, a barnstorming of Iowa by President Theodore Roosevelt on this date, April 28th. 1903. I want to thank you for being here. I also want to mention that on occasion, as I extrapolate or have a thought and ramble through uh, some unprepared text, I'll occasionally make a stumble or a misstatement. And I assure you that the editorial staff at Teddy Talks is quite aware of those. Early on, I had an, an illusion, uh, put Washington and Lee University in Virginia in the wrong town. So my apologies to the good people of Lexington, Virginia, and Yellowstone rambling on about 1903. I mentioned Theodore Roosevelt heading out west and meeting up and camping with John Muir. I got my Y parks mixed up. Of course, that was Yosemite, not Yellowstone, but uh, uh, this isn't always connected to this. So uh, keep you on your toes for that sort of thing. Uh, today in history, uh, we uh, acknowledge the birthday in uh, 1758 of President James Monroe, part of the Virginia dynasty. Um, and uh, President Monroe, uh, of many things, gave us uh, the Monroe Doctrine, announced in 1823 during his State of the Union address. Most historians say a great deal of credit should go to his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, the future president, uh, who prepared much of that foreign relations text as Secretary of State. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the Monroe Doctrine, told the powers of Europe uh, uh, that, uh, and by implication Asia, that we would not uh, tolerate uh, any uh, European intrigue, the attempt to settle more colonies, uh, establish more colonies, or overthrow independent governments in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas. Uh, we stated that. We didn't always live up to that in the 19th century, allowing the British and Germans to blockade Venezuela, other actions. Uh, but eventually, Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, added something that in history and politics we call the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, he too, I believe, announcing this in a State of the Union address, is the idea uh, in simple terms that America would be the policeman of the Western Hemisphere. We would not tolerate uh, European governments, most especially uh, at this time, Germany and England, uh, because they would have financial arrangements with uh, governments like Venezuela or the Dominican Republic, uh, that if those uh, Western governments did not pay their debt obligations, well, we weren't the only ones uh, exercising gunboat diplomacy. Uh, there were actions taken by both of those governments uh, that uh, prompted Theodore Roosevelt to say, we'll do the policing here. If, if uh, debt is owed, we'll make sure that these Latin American governments pay their debts, indeed, even if we have to uh, land Marines uh, to make sure, sure they do so, uh, something that we did in the Dominican uh, later in Haiti. And so, uh, uh, President Monroe, we salute you on your birthday today. Uh, the anniversary of the death of General Fitzhugh Lee. Uh, he's sometimes referred to in works about and by uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he, the nephew of uh, General Robert E. Lee, uh, Fitzhugh Lee's father, a captain in the Confederate Navy, and, and young Fitzhugh Lee himself uh, in the Confederate forces, uh, one of four general officers uh, who had formerly been officers in the Confederacy serving in the Spanish-American War. At the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, the former governor of Virginia, Fitzhugh Lee, a one-term Democratic governor, uh, he was serving as consul general uh, in Cuba. Uh, representing the United States government uh, in Havana. It was his dispatches and telegrams in January of 1898 that uh, uh, secretly uh, then uh, with the uh, secret code $2, uh, a naval cable sent the USS Maine, the battleship headed on a peaceful mission to Havana Harbor, blown up subsequently February 15th. Fitzhugh Lee uh, uh, reporting to the American government about developments there and then serving the government during the war, uh, not seeing action, but being uh, nearby the front and then uh, serving as our uh, military uh, officer in charge of Havana, Leonard Wood uh, uh, taking uh, uh, a part of that work as well. There's a wonderful little incident uh, I'd love to read to you recounted 
uh, in Theodore Roosevelt, or in Edmund Morris's The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Here's, a, here's an old copy. Uh, it's uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, it's the first of the uh, Morris trilogies. Highly recommended. Uh, one of the most important books in, in my lifetime. Really explains in great part why I'm doing what I do. The uh, United States uh, uh, except, uh, raised its flag above uh, Santiago, the uh, city it had besieged, the, the city of the uh, Battle of San Juan uh, Hill in the heights outside of uh, Santiago, uh, did so on Sunday, July 17th. A, a couple of days later, uh, Fitzhugh Lee, General Fitzhugh Lee, uh, invites uh, uh, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt and one of his officers, Lieutenant Jack Greenway, down to Moro Castle. Uh, this is a great castle that uh, guarded the entryway to uh, the harbor at uh, the city of Santiago de Cuba. Uh, it saw action uh, during the uh, the battles, uh, naval action just outside there, naval vessels, including uh, the USS Merrimack, uh, which the United States attempted to block the harbor. You'll recall that the Spanish fleet winds up being decimated as it attempts to steam out and, and make its escape. We track those ships down one at a time, but at first attempted to uh, block them in the harbor by sinking the Merrimack. So uh, here's what, uh, uh, through the recounting of General Fitzhugh Lee and Lieutenant Jack Greenway, uh, what we know of Theodore Roosevelt's visit down to the Merrimack. Uh, the two officers had been invited to Morrow Castle by General Fitzhugh Lee, and Roosevelt's attention was drawn to the wreck of the Merrimack some 300 yards out to sea. It would be fun, he said, pulling off his clothes, to go out and inspect her. What a colonel suggested a lieutenant was bound to obey, and Greenway reluctantly agreed to accompany Roosevelt into the water. We weren't out more than a dozen strokes before Lee, who had clambered up on the parapet of Fort Moreau, began to yell. Can you make out what he's trying to say? The old man asked, punctuating his words with long overhand strokes. Shark, says I, wishing I were back on shore. Shark, says the colonel, blowing out a mouthful of water. They, stroke, won't, stroke, bite, stroke. I've been, stroke, studying them, stroke, all my life, stroke, and I never, stroke, heard of one, stroke, bothering a swimmer, stroke. It's all, stroke, poppycock. <laughs> Just then, a big fellow, probably not more than 10 or 12 feet long, but looking as big as a battleship to me, showed up alongside us. Then came another, till we had quite a group. The colonel didn't pay the least attention. Meantime, the old general was doing a war dance up on the parapet, shouting and standing first on one foot and then on the other, and working his arms like he was doing something on a bet. Finally, we re reached the wreck, and I felt better. The colonel, of course, got busy looking things over. I had to pretend I was interested, but I was thinking of the sharks and getting back to shore. I didn't hurry the colonel in his inspection either. After a while, he had seen enough, and we went over the side again. Soon the sharks were all about us again, sort of pacing us in as they had paced us out while the old general did the second part of his war dance. He felt a whole lot better when we landed, and so did I. The life of Theodore Roosevelt, he wrote or said, sometimes I like to drink the wine of life with a little brandy in it. Uh, an interesting statement for a man who uh, did not drink. Um, we're going to have some great programs on ahead. And a little note about Lieutenant Jack Greenway to a uh, bully for the people of Arizona. Uh, while Greenway was a man of the East, uh, he uh, settled after the war in Arizona. Uh, he would eventually marry Isabel uh, uh, Selms Ferguson. Uh, Isabel Selms uh, stood up as uh, a, uh, a single woman at the wedding of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's niece. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt gave Eleanor away at that wedding at which the young Ms. Selms stood. Ms. Selms would marry Monroe Ferguson, a man of Scots descent uh, in Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Rider Regiment. Uh, the man was in ill health. I think tuberculosis went out to the Southwest for his health, and uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson died. Lieutenant Jack Greenway, his compatriot in the regiment, married Isabel Selms Ferguson, she becoming Mrs. Greenway. 
Jack Greenway ran the great mining industry in Arizona and served the people of Arizona. And for years, uh, his statue was one of the two statues representing the state of Arizona, then General Jack Greenway for his service in World War I. Uh, and now the uh, statue has been replaced by that of Senator Barry Goldwater, the uh, man of Prescott and United States Senator and presidential candidate. Isabella Greenway, following the death of General Jack Greenway, she would go on to be elected in her own right without being a widow candidate. She was elected the first female member of Congress from the state of Arizona during Cousin Franklin's administration. Uh, in future programs tomorrow, we'll stay on the 1903 tour and come back uh, in 1916 to the states of Missouri and Illinois, the show me state in the land of Lincoln. Uh, we'll address uh, William Randolph Hearst on his birthday, uh, a, uh, uh, one of the foils against which Theodore Roosevelt operates during his presidency. Uh, we also uh, then on Thursday the 30th will have remarks at the dedication of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis on the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase. Friday, May 1st, a sampling of documents and speeches from Theodore Roosevelt's life and public service and special attention paid then to the Battle of Manila Bay, the role of Admiral George Dewey. Uh, Gridley, you may fire when ready. In an editorial note there, we're going to Fire when ready on May 1st here in Medora, North Dakota, a bit of a, a soft opening, as they say. We're going to open with the uh, advice and consent of uh, the governor and the governor's representatives in the state of North Dakota. Uh, and this uh, still, if things go according to plan, May 1st, we'll open the bully pulpit. And, and maybe that phrase, fire when ready, gridly, uh, can be uh, used out on the course uh, by our uh, golf course uh, marshal. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, George Dewey would go on to consider running for the presidency in 1904 as a Democrat uh, from his home state of Vermont. May 2nd, uh, remarks to the graduating class of the United States Naval Academy. Uh, that same evening, remarks to the Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, of which Theodore Roosevelt was a member. Uh, Gallaudet College, uh, the famous college for the deaf in Washington, D.C., and the unveiling of a statue for General George McClellan. Uh, he also Democratic candidate for the presidency, 1864. And uh, well, I'm so glad that you're here today. Barnstorming, Iowa barnstorming, uh, uh, troops of entertainers used to travel through the rural districts and put on shows. Uh, those are very often uh, being done in the barns. Uh, later, it was said that when a politician toured through, uh, uh, usually by train and through the countryside, they were barnstorming. And later, sort of in the spirit of those early aviators, uh, barnstorming as was said to be what the uh, uh, early uh, daredevil pilots who made their living by putting on air shows. Very often those were out in the countryside and might even include uh, some sort of trick uh, as flying through the barn that maybe you've seen. So our... Uh, Progress in Iowa, April 28th, 1903, is to uh, leave Omaha before dawn, special train for the president, proceeding from west to east. We know that Theodore Roosevelt made a great loop of the country in 1903, but uh, with scheduling and destinations and railroads, uh, uh, it wasn't always just this uh, continuous big loop. It had its back and forths and ups and downs, and, and this is a return from a, a trip that brought him west here to... Uh, uh, to Medora, out to Yellowstone with John Burroughs, and back through uh, Wyoming and uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, and, uh, and now Iowa. I'll uh, have a few editorial comments along the way, and I think I'll try to show you what Theodore Roosevelt had to do in a day's worth of uh, making these whistle-stop campaign uh, speeches. Again, uh, that uh, phrase still being in, even though we don't travel by train, uh, it being that uh, at each whistle stop uh, where the train stopped long enough to unload some freight and mail and take it on some passengers, not even necessarily always a, a great train depot, but uh, anywhere along the way, the president might come out on the end of the caboose, uh, that railing, uh, that, that uh, scene that seems so ubiquitous in the turn of the century for our political speeches. Starting in Shenandoah and with no further delay. Mr. Mayor, and you, my fellow citizens, it is a very great pleasure to greet you this morning and to say a word of appreciation to you for coming here to welcome me. In thanking all of you, I know the others will not object to my saying a special word of greeting 
to the men who from 61 to 65 did the great deeds because of which we now have a country because of which there is a president to come and speak with you it has always seemed to me that after all in civil life what we have to do is merely to apply practically the principles which you and your comrades applied in the civil war it was not in the last resort genius or brilliancy that won in the civil war you needed that you had to develop it in a sense you had to develop finally as the years went by men like grant and sherman and thomas and sheridan and farragut but the factor that was decisive in the war was the fighting quality of the individual soldier that is what counted that is what you were concerned with knowing you needed the uniform you needed the training the rifle you needed a good rifle, but the best rifle, if in the hands of a poor man, would mean that he would be beaten by a good man with a club. It is the man that counts in the long run. We won because our people, from 61 to 65, had in them the stuff that made them see to it that the policy of Lincoln was upheld, that the course which he sought for most should be traveled undeviatingly. So it is in civil life now. We need all that there is at the command of the nation in special training to meet the problems that arise from time to time. And yet, in their ultimate analysis, these problems must be solved by just the same qualities which each man brings to solve the problems of his own life, which the soldiers of the Civil War brought to the solving of the problem that was ahead of them. In the first place, we need honesty. And I use the word in its broadest acceptation. Decency, the spirit that makes a man behave well in his own family, that makes him a good neighbor, a good friend, the spirit that makes one man love another, that makes both love and serve the state. In the Civil War, the fundamental quality that you had to have was the quality that made you willing to need, uh, at need to lay down your lives for the flag, the spirit of patriotism, the spirit of love of country. And by itself, that is not enough. You have got to have virtue, and you have got to have something more. In 61 to 65, it did not make any difference how patriotic a man was. If he did not have in him the stuff out of which you could make a fighting man, you could do but little with him. I do not care how patriotic he was. If he was timid, there was nothing to be done with him. Besides virtue, decency, honesty, you must have the qualities which we speak of when we say of a man that he is not only a good man, but emphatically a man. You must have hardihood, courage, strength, the desire to not sit at home in ease and say how wrong the world has gone, but the desire to go out and do your part to right it. You remember in 61 to 65, there was plenty to stay at home and say how poorly the war was being carried on. But the fellow that did the job was the man who went out and did his duty on the field of battle. That is the man that counts, and so it is now. The man that counts in life is the man that goes out and tries to do the thing. The man who makes his way in private life is not the man who dreams golden dreams, but the man who tries to put them into practice, who works at his profession, who tries to count in this world. So it is in public life, and so it is in doing all the work of the nation that has got to be done. In addition to virtue, in addition to the spirit of loving kindness, to the love that each man should have for his fellows, you must have the strong virile qualities, the qualities of hardihood, of manliness and courage. And finally, in addition to these two sets of qualities, you must have another also. It makes but little difference how brave a man is or how honest he is. If the man is a fool, you can do but little with him. We need courage, we need decency, and we need the saving grace of common sense. In concluding, my fellow citizens, after having thanked all of you, and thanked especially the men and women, I shall say just one word of congratulation upon the fact of meeting so many children. I am mighty glad of all your products, and of your children especially. I am glad to see that they are all right in quality and all right in quantity. I believe in the stock, and I want to see it keep up. At Clarendon, Iowa, Mr. Mayor, and you, my fellow citizens, 
It is indeed a great pleasure to have the chance of seeing you this morning and of being here in your great and beautiful state. As I go through your state and see the soil, the crops, and above all the men and women, I do not wonder that Iowa is all right. In thanking you all, I know the others will not grudge my saying a special word of thanks to those who, beyond any others in the nation, are entitled to the gratitude of all of us, to the men of the Grand Army of the Republic. We have a country, and there is a president to address you just because of what you did from 61 to 65. I am going to go from one extreme to the other. I greet the Grand Army first. Next, I want to greet the younger generation. I like your stock, and I am glad to see it is being kept up. The children look all right in quality and quantity. And now one word to them, and it is about the same kind of word I would speak to you. I am awfully glad to see you, boys and girls. I believe in play, and I believe in work, and I am pretty sure from the faces of some of the small boys I see that they believe in play too. Play hard while you play, but do not play while you work. Work hard while you work. That is sound sense, and it is sound sense for the children of the larger growth for all of us. I believe in having a good time in life, but I do not believe in shirking any work for the sake of having a good time. I am sure that each one of us knows in his or her acquaintance some unwise father, I regret, regret to state an occasional mother, who having worked hard and done his or her duty well, seems to forget that life in the long run is satisfactory about in the proportion that it means duty well done and deliberately starts to bring up his or her child to do nothing. Uh, to be a little soft-hearted and try to shield them from all work. You have seen the mother who becomes a mere household drudge, say that her daughter shall not touch a stitch of work, or the father who is a hard-working man who lets his boys grow up as idlers, and then that father or mother will have a feeling that it is because they are so fond of their children. It is not because they are fond of their children, it is because they are foolish. The poorest lesson that any American can be taught is the lesson of trying merely to have a good time, of trying to shirk what is hard and unpleasant. I have spoken a word about the men of the Civil War. From 61 to 65, you gave up the life of ease at home. You left your families, you left comfort, and you went into the army. Heaven knows you did not enter it for the money. It was only $11 or $13 a month. I have forgotten which. You knew what it was to march all day long under the intolerable heat of the southern sun in summer, when at about noon, if you were recru recruits, one blanket was so heavy you threw it away, and at midnight you would like to. You knew what it was to lie out in the frozen mud of the trenches in winter. You faced fever cots in the hospital, death and maiming in battle. You saw the brightest and bravest pour out their life's blood like water all for the sake of an ideal. It was because you had it in you to do that, that we doff our hats to you now, that we stand here as freemen of the greatest republic upon which the sun has ever shone. If you will look back over your lives as you hand on the memories to your children and to your country, to what part of your life is it a pleasure? The easy part? No. It was when you dared and did all you could do and toiled and worked and fought and spent your sweat and your blood in saving the nation. What is true of you in military life is true of all of us in civil life. Each man here, as he grows older, looks back with pleasure and is glad to recall to the memories of his children, not the days that were easiest, but the days when he did his best work. That is what counts having work to do that is worth doing, and then doing it as well as a man can. In the long run, that is the greatest pleasure in life, and of all social pleasures, the one which quickest turns to dust and ashes in the mouth is the love of pleasure for pleasure's own sake. The man or the woman who deliberately sits down to try to lead a life that shall be merely one that shall result in selfish pleasure is not only a curse to the community, but a curse to himself or herself as well. In bringing up your children, the lesson to teach them is not how to shirk difficulties, but how to meet them and overcome them. Here in Iowa, you have built up this great state.
because you had in you the stuff out of which good citizenship is made. You have built up this city and the hundreds of others like it. You have built up the country around you because your people have tried to do a man's work as a man's work should be done. That is what counts in the nation. Two qualities, the desire to act squarely and decently, the desire to show in practical shape that you love your brother, that you will do what you can to help him and your duty by the state, the desire to show the belief in you in morality, in honesty and in decency is not with you in empty form. And then in addition to that, the sanity that makes you follow out that virtue in a practical fashion. Cloistered virtue does not count. In the Civil War, it did not make any difference how patriotic a man was if he ran away. You wanted to have the man in the right feeling first, the right feeling for the flag, the right feeling for the country, and then to have him of the fiber that would make him stay put when the time came. So it is in civic and social life now. So it is in the life of the man in his family, of the man in his relations to his neighbors, in his relations to the state. You have got to be decent. You have got to have morality. You have got to have virtue, not of the cloistered type, not virtue that sits at home in its parlor and wishes things were well outside, but the type of virtue that comes to the strong man who, when he sees a wrong, wishes to go out and right it, who is glad to step down into the hurly-burly of battle, in the struggle of actual life, and does his best to bring things about as they should be brought. In closing, let me thank particularly the members of the National Guard for having turned out as an escort. Let me say how glad I am to meet you. I believe in you with all my heart and soul, and I wish you well always. At Sharpsburg, Iowa, my friends and fellow citizens, I wish to say what a pleasure it is to me to greet you this morning and how I appreciate your coming to see me. The women, the men, and the small folks, I am an expert in those, for I have six myself, and as I believe in your stock, I want to see it kept up. It is a great pleasure to me to come through your beautiful state and to see your prosperity, a prosperity due in part to your soil and climate, but due mainly to the character of your men and women. That is all the important factor in determining the upgrowth of any state of the Union. We need good laws. We need good, honest, and fearless administration of the laws. And we need to have the laws administered without respect to persons, so that whether a man be rich or poor, whether he be in one occupation or another, he shall be held to accountability under the law and protected by the law. In the long run, as I said, it is the character of the individual man or individual woman that counts most in the making up of a state. Exactly as in the army, I care not what the training is or what the weapons are. You can get but little fight out of the army if the average soldier has not the fight in him. So it is in citizenship. There are other nations which have copied our constitution and our laws, but the result has been wholly different because they did not have the type of citizen behind the law. As in battle, it is the man behind the gun that counts, so in a community, it is the men back of the law that count most. Upon them must we rely for proper results under our constitution and our laws. I greet you. I believe in you with all my heart. I think that Iowa's future will be even greater than her past. I wish you good luck. At Van Wert, Iowa, my fellow citizens, it is indeed a great pleasure to meet you this morning and to come through your great and beautiful state. I do not wonder that Iowa has taken the position it has in the councils of the nation, that it has assumed the leadership which it has done, when I see not merely your soils, your farms, your products, but those best of all products are the men and women. You have in the territory the raw material out of which to make the state, but it has been made because those in it have had in them the stuff with which to make it. At every place that I have stopped, I have seen men carrying the button, which recalls to mind the fact that in the time that tried men's souls, Iowa sent her sons to the front to pour out their blood like water for the cause of the Union. The qualities that these men showed in military life are, after all, the same qualities which we need in order to bring success in civil affairs. Unless there is a fundamental spirit of decency, 
of honesty, of regard for right living, no success will come to the state any more than to the individual. Of all qualities to be abhorred in a republic like ours, the quality which is sometimes called smartness, ability unaccompanied by scruple is the worst. That is the quality which makes a bad neighbor and an evil public servant. The abler, the more fearless a man is, if he has not got the root of decent living in him, the more dangerous he is to the state. We must have as the basis of citizenship a high ideal, a decent observance of the law and of the relationships of human society, but such alone will not avail. In addition to virtue, if you are to make it count, you have to have strength and courage back of it. But little can be done with a man who is afraid. The timid man is of no use. I do not care how good he is. And scant need be our patience with the virtue which sits at home, in its own house, and says how bad the world is. You want morality, decency, high thinking, and in addition you must have the qualities which we speak of when we say of anyone that he is not merely a good man, but a man. The qualities that make a man fit to do his work in the actual hurly-burly of real life. The qualities which, if we are wise, each of us will strive to instill into the minds of his sons, of his daughters, so as to teach the boy and the girl that the thing to do in life is not to find some way of dodging difficulties, but to meet them and overcome them. In the Great War, in addition to being patriots, it was necessary to have the quality of staying put. You needed in the army the men who loved their country, and you also needed the man who did not run, or if he ran, ran in the right direction. You had to have a combination of these two qualities. The president goes on to Osceola, Iowa. He'll refer to uh, Colonel Hepburn. Hepburn. Uh, this is Congressman William Peters Hepburn, uh, born in 1833, deceased 1916, a colonel in the Second Regiment Iowa Volunteer Cavalry in the Civil War, and an 11-term Republican congressman from Iowa, serving from 1881 to 87 and from 1893 to 1909. According to a historian, Edmund Morris, quote, Hepburn was the House's best debater, admired for his strength of character and legal acumen, unquote. As chairman of the House Committee on Foreign and Interstate Commerce, he guided or sponsored many statutes regulating business, including most notably the Hepburn Act of 1906. The Hepburn Act authorized the United States Interstate Commerce Commission to require railroads to charge, quote, just and reasonable, unquote, rates. Uh, so uh, a reference to uh, Hepburn here at Osceola, Iowa. It is a great pleasure to come here today and be introduced by Colonel Hepburn who has been traveling with me throughout his district. And in departing from it and from him, I wish to state my sense of obligation to him and to all the Iowa delegation for the aid they gave me last year, the invaluable aid in bringing about certain bits of legislation, nonpartisan in character, which I deemed of the utmost importance, such as a wise supervision and regulation of certain great corporations of the type popularly known as trusts notably of those engaged in doing an interstate business, legislation which I deemed invaluable, not only because of its courage, but because of its sanity, and because it does not pretend to do anything that it does not do. A promise should be kept on the stump just as much as off the stump. The worth of any promise lies in its fulfillment by action, and it was, thanks to Colonel Hepburn, thanks to Congress, to the members of both the Senate and the House from Iowa and their fellows, that I am able to come before you feeling that all that has been said by us as to the need for such regulation has been made good in fact. Improvements in the law have been made, better legislation has been put on the statute books, and the legislation on the statute books has been enforced with honesty and with fearlessness. An address at the Capitol grounds, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, there are references to Colonel Hall, that's Congressman John Albert Tiffin Hall, a veteran of the Union Army, and uh, Governor Albert Cummins, later United States Senator from Iowa. My friend and fellow citizens, I almost begin to think I have seen all of Iowa. I have enjoyed to the full coming through your beautiful state and great state and seeing this beautiful city. It is a great pleasure to come here, Mr. Mayor, and be presented in Des Moines. I have been traveling all day with my old and honored personal friend, the governor of your great state, a man with whom I have been associated in many ways for a number of years, whom I have grown to prize and value, and it is a great pleasure to have been with him today. 
I wish also here in this city to bear, bear testimony to the invaluable work being done by your Congressman, Colonel Hull. For over a century, from the days of Washington, almost every president has been asking that we should have a good militia law and a proper organization of the regular army. And now, thanks largely to Colonel Hull, we have them both. In thanking all of you, I wish to say a special word of greeting and acknowledgement to the men of the Great War, to the men to whom we owe it that there is today a country and a president here, and to the men who taught us not only what to do in war, but what to do in peace. The war once over, you turn to the tasks of peace with the same steadfast which you had displayed in dealing with an armed foe. And unworthy indeed would be we be of you if we failed now to try to do our best in solving the problems of our day. I want to thank also those of my escort who were my comrades, our comrades in 1898 and immediately thereafter. You of the Great War did not have the trouble we had. You did not have to complain that there was not enough war to go around. With us, all that we could do was to try to show that at least we had inherited a portion of the spirit that made you victorious in the great contest. And I think I can say that we feel amply repaid if you of the big war think that we did show that spirit. Having turned from the veterans, from the man of the great deeds of the past, now just one word to the people of the future, the small folks. I am mighty glad to have seen all the children here today. And I have one word to say to them, which after all, with but slight changes, I would say to their elders, I believe in work and I believe in play. Play hard while you play, and when you work, quit playing and work. I congratulate Iowa on a great many things. I congratulate Iowa on her soil and her climate. I congratulate her on her crops, her products, but I congratulate her especially on her crop of children. They seem to be all right from the standpoint of both quality and a quantity, and as I like the stock, I am glad it is not dying out. My friends and fellow citizens, there is but little I can say to you today, for I'm glad to say that Iowa can teach rather than learn the lesson of good citizenship. I have said a word to the men of the Great War, to the veterans of the Great War standing there. Now let me say a word to my comrades of the Lesser War, to the 51st Iowa. You and I of the younger generations did not have the tasks that you, the men of the Great War, had. All we had to do was show that we were willing. I trust I may say anxious, if the opportunity to arose to show ourselves not wholly unworthy of the men of the mighty days from 61 to 65. And now in peace, my comrades, I ask that you and I and our fellow citizens should do our best to solve the great civic problems that confront us at the beginning of the 20th century in the same spirit with which the men of the days of Lincoln and of Grant approached the mighty problems they had to solve the problems are various. Different qualities are needed to solve them, and yet fundamentally they must be solved by the exercises of exactly the virtues that you brought to the support of Lincoln and of Grant. We can work out and we will work, work out uh, all of the problems, difficult though they may be, which face us, if we approach them in a spirit in which we shall combine courage, sanity, a jealous regard for the rights of others, and a firm determination to permit no wrong on us or on anyone else. If we draw distinctions other than those based upon uh, the good conduct of any man, we are recreant uh, to the principles of 1776 and of 1861 to 65. We are not to be pardoned if we show either one of the two traits, either the trait of an arrogant looking down upon and disregard for those who are less well off, or on the other hand, the equally mean and base trait of jealousy and rancorous hatred for those who are better off because they are better off. We must hold the scales of justice even. We must stand for each man on his merits. Be neither for nor against him because he is rich or because he is poor. Stand for him if he is a decent man, but stand against him if he is not a straight man. These are perfectly simple rules, but these are a lot of good rules that are perfectly simple. Uh, the Decalogue and the Golden Rule are quite old, but they are good all the same. We have to apply them, as I say, according to the circumstances. But there is not a question of legislation or administration. 
There is not a question to be solved in connection with our complex industrial life, the life in which the wage worker, the farmer, and the businessman now play the three chief parts. There is not a question which we cannot solve aright if we will approach it in a spirit of sanity, and with patience, with courage, with a firm determination to solve it in accordance with the immutable laws of righteous and fair dealing as between man and man. You, my friend, you of the great war, fought to maintain and perfect a government of orderly liberty under the law, under which we have a liberty, not license, but a liberty guaranteed by the law of the land, a liberty based upon the principle of treating each man on his merits as a man. Each one of you, as you went into battle, what cared you in reference to the man on the right hand or the left? Did you care as to the creed according to which he worshipped his maker? No. Did you care for his social position? No. Did you care for his wealth? Hardly. What you wanted to know was whether the time of stress came, he would stay put. This is what we want to know about any man with whom we deal in civil life now. And if we will remain true to that principle of judging each man on his worth as a man, we shall make a success of our government to a degree such as never before been known in the history of the nations of mankind. I am behindhand in the schedule, and incredible though it may seem, there are other people in Iowa, and I have to leave now. I shall only say what a pleasure it has been to me to catch a glimpse of you. I wish I could have spoken to you all, but it has not been possible to reach more than a small fringe. At the auditorium in Des Moines, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, when I see this audience before me, it is a matter of real re regret to me that I have not the time to stay and speak to you at length, owing to the fact that Iowa has been so very attractive that I have been getting behind time going through it. All I can do is to thank you for your greetings and wish you well. I have enjoyed to the full my trip today through your great and beautiful state and my visit to your beautiful city. I have enjoyed the drive. I want to say that I appreciate the quality of the horsemanship of those who accompanied me on this drive, and from the appearance of that part of the guard immediately behind me, I should have been glad to have had them in my regiment. I will say sincerely and without flattery that it does me good to travel through your state, though I am glad to see you with so fertile a soil, though I am glad to learn of your abounding prosperity and all that you raise, yet I am most glad of the quality of citizenship you raise. I suppose there is no state in the Union which surpasses Iowa in the average of happiness of its citizens. You are fortunate in your farming districts, in your farming population, and in the character of your cities. Iowa is among the leading states of agricultural life, and of course, in recent years, the use of the telephone, the use of electric cars, the introduction of rural free delivery, has made an enormous difference towards equalizing the advantages of the country and city. And glad though I am to come into cities like this, I know that even the people of the cities will not misrepresent the saying that I am particularly glad to see the farm grow more attractive so that the young men will stay in the country. We cannot afford uh, to fail to do all in our power to keep up the standard of our country population. So I want to say how glad I am to be here, how glad I am to be greeted thus. And I want to say that I am particularly glad of having been greeted by so many children. They seem all right in quality and are all right in quantity. I congratulate you, I believe in you, and I want to see others grow up like you. Goodbye and good luck. At the dedication of the Young Men's Christian Association building at Oskaloosa, Iowa, the reference to Congressman John Fletcher Lacey deserves its own program and uh, will return to John Fletcher Lacey, the father of the Lacey Acts of 1900 and 1907 and of the Monuments and Antiquities Act of 1906, well utilized by Theodore Roosevelt, 18 national monuments as a result of uh, uh, that legislation. At the dedication of the Young Men's Christian Association building at Oskaloosa, Iowa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with pleasure that I come here to take part in the dedication of this YMCA building. I feel that there is something peculiarly appropriate in the presence of the men who fought in the Great War at any ceremony which tends to make for decency, for high thinking, for good citizenship. I wish first to say one word about your congressman, Mr. Lacey, at whose request I stopped. 
in public life generally, we are not apt to find the man whose interests go for the whole country, as well as for those who have his immediate fate in their hands. And I wish to congratulate this district on having in the American Congress a man who spends his best efforts for the whole United States. Gentlemen, I never say before a man what I would not say behind him or vice versa, and I do not speak hyperbolically. I say what I mean, and I wish to pay this tribute to Mr. Lacey. Wherever there is a matter that I feel is of real and serious consequence to the nation as a whole, I can ask Mr. Lacey to come to me or can go to him with the absolute certainty that he will approach the matter simply from the standpoint of the public service. He wishes to do well his duty by the public, and the fact that the work is worth doing is a sufficient reward for doing it, and that I regard as high praise for any man in public life. Now, a word about the building itself and what purpose it serves. We cannot afford to have our civilization go on without united and ordered effort on the part of decent people to see that the forces of decency have the upper hand. We do not need to bother about the weeds. They will grow anyhow. But the grain needs some careful tending, and nothing augurs better for the future of this country than the way in which efforts are made such as this, which has resulted in the erection of this association building here. Nature abhors a vacuum. And if you leave a young man's time, when he is at liberty, absolutely vacant, he will fill it. And it is liable with what is not best worth having in it. Give him occupation. Give him the chance to improve himself. Make the path fairly easy that leads to clean living and decent work. And you will help him up more than you will by a hundred mere preachings. You will give the, him the chance to be decent. More and more, the Young Men's Christian Association has tended to do good throughout the nation because it has proceeded in, no, uh, in, in so sane a spirit, a spirit which seeks not to dwarf or suppress healthy instincts, but to get them to turn in the right direction. Because, like all true educational institutions, it recognizes what an education must mean. We are all of us being educated all the time. That it can help the body that it can help what is of more good than the body, the mind, and finally, that it can help what counts for far more than mind and body, character, the sum of all qualities that we call character. That is what counts in the long run. It is a good thing to be a strong man. It is a better thing to be an intelligent and intellectual man, but best of all, it is to be a man, a good roan, a brave and a strong man. That is what counted, my comrades, with you in the Great War. When you went into that struggle, you went into a struggle that could have been brought to a successful conclusion only by men whose stout bodies and cool heads united with brave heart. That is what counted in the long months of inaction, in the weariness of the marches, in the sleepless vigils of the cold winter nights, and finally in the red-hot fire and agony of the fight. That was when you proved the stuff that there was in the man. Then you could see the qualities that you had to have in order to make the man able to do a little more than his fair share. And it is just so in our life now, in our life relative to the state, the life of the man in his own family, or in dealing with his neighbors. The thing that counts is the combination of qualities which we call character, at the core of which we call decency, honesty, the spirit that makes a man treat his fellows squarely and fairly, that makes him a good husband, a good father, a good neighbor, a good man to do business with, a good man to have his property next to yours or to work beside in the shop or on the farm. And decency is not enough. In addition to this, you have to have something else. Just as you, the men of the Great War, needed more than patriotism, you had to have the quality of courage, the usual quality of hardihood, the quality of iron strength. I do not care how patriotic a man was. If he had a tendency to run away, there was nothing to be done with him. So it is now. You have got to have decency, honesty, virtue, morality as the bedrock. But if you have got nothing built upon it, it is a poor structure. The virtue that sits at home and complains that vice has the upper hand, the parlor virtue, the far-sighted virtue does not count. 
What you need is the good man who is not afraid. That virtue that will go out into the world and try to do something. The decent man who is not afraid of the hurly-burly of actual life. And it is rough work, too. Most things that are worth having come by effort. That is true in civil life as in military. You need decency. You need courage. And in addition to this, you need the saving grace of common sense. Common sense you have got to have to guide the other aright. It is a mighty good thing to have softness of heart, but it is a pity when the softness extends its area and you get softness of the head as well. I congratulate you, the people of this beautiful state, upon what you are doing upon the higher life of which the erection of this building is but a symbol. In closing, let me say how glad I am to be here how I have enjoyed coming through Iowa. Let me thank especially the men of the Grand Army for coming out and then my own comrades, the men of the National Guard for coming here to act as escort. I was pleased to pass so many children. I congratulate Iowa on many things, on her soil, her climate, her crops, but above all her citizenship. I congratulate her upon the men and women who have made her what she is. Because, men and women, I do not have to do much preaching to you. I feel rather more like sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. I feel that you practice what I want to preach, and I congratulate you in it. Finally, as I said, I like crops, but, I, but as I like your stock, the crop I like best to see is the children. I congratulate you on their quality. That is all right, and it seems to me the quantity is all right. I like your stock and I should be very sorry to see it die out. We wrap up the day, April 28th in Iowa, at Atumwa, Iowa. Uh, Keokuk's going to have to wait for the morning. Mr. Senator, and you, my fellow citizens, it is indeed a privilege to have the chance of addressing you this evening, and I have enjoyed greatly my trip through Iowa today. As I began to speak at seven o'clock this morning, and as I have met about every man, woman, and child within a reasonable radius of the railway, I will not detain you long. I wish to say in greeting to you all and in expressing my acknowledgement of the magnificent reception you have tendered me here, that I know you will not object to my saying a special word of greeting to the men of the Grand Army of the Republic, because the rest of us owe the fact that there is a president of this country to what they did. And they teach us a lesson not merely of war, but also of peace. For mighty as was the triumph they won in the years that closed at Appomattox, mighty also was the deed when the army disbanded and the brave boys in blue went back to their counting rooms, their shops, their farms, and each took up the work he had abandoned when President Lincoln called for arms. I am speaking in one of the chief manufacturing cities of Iowa, and to those from round about who come from that rich agricultural country, which takes in practically the entire prosperous and happy state, I congratulate you upon your prosperity and upon your well-being. Something can be done, I think I may say has been done, by law to create and preserve that condition of well-being, and more can be done by honest and faithful administration of the law. But most of all, such well-being depends upon the character of the average man. It was just so in the war. You needed uniforms, needed good guns, needed training, but you didn't wait. If there was any man who hadn't the stuff in him, you couldn't get it out of him. And we won because the average man in blue had the sturdy constitution, the courage, iron will, and dauntless resolution. These characteristics moved them to enlist, and they saw them through the war. And here we are in this great state which was built up, not merely by the soil or the climate, but because of the right kind of men and women who were not afraid of work, who were not seeking to lead a life of ease and enjoyment, but rather to play their parts well in the world. I have drawn more than one lesson from your careers. Now allow me to draw another. You, when you left a life of ease, left your home and dear ones, and went down to spend the best years of your youth marching under the hot sun of a southern summer, you for whom at noon the blanket was too heavy, and if a recruit you dropped it, but at midnight you found that two blankets were not near enough. And as you look back over your past lives, of what years are you proud? The years of ease and pleasant prosperity? No, the years of effort and toil 
and when you risked your lives, endured your wounds, faced unflinchingly the fever cots in the war hospitals, and saw the best among you shed their blood for the sake of the lofty idea which led them on. So it is in peace. Look back, each man of you, at the part of your life of which you are proudest to tell your children, the part you wish them to follow. It is not when conditions were the easiest, but the time when life was hard, when there were obstacles to overcome, dangers to be dealt with, that's what you hope to see your children emulate. Oh, men and women of Iowa, I believe in you and in your sturdy manhood and womanhood. And therefore, I know that you will teach your children not to go through life choosing the easiest course that they can pursue, but will see that they rather choose the hardest, that they trample down the obstacles which intervene in their way to success. That is what makes men and women like the citizens of Iowa. I owe a peculiar debt of gratitude to Iowa because I have taken a quarter of my cabinet from this state. Somebody has intimated that this is more than Iowa's share, but I say that when any other state does as well relatively in citizenship, then I will take a quarter from it. I have traveled all day through Iowa with my valued friend, Secretary Shaw of the Treasury Department, and now I would say a few words regarding the absent Secretary, Mr. Wilson. It was very fitting that from Iowa should come the Sac Secretary of Agriculture, for no state in the Union has done more to develop the highest grade of farming than has this. Both the experimental work by the government and educational work by the state have been employed to make the farmer's work one of such scientific skill as to put it fairly beside any of the more prominent professions. It is a mere truism to say that upon the welfare of the farmer and wage worker, where it rests the welfare of the entire state. If the condition of these two great classes are well, the rest of the state is also right. And therefore, residents of this city of manufactories and wage workers in this state of farmers, I congratulate you on having so well solved your share of the problems which confront the entire nation. I don't have to do much preaching in Iowa. I think your practice sets a mark for my preaching here. I don't have to preach in the presence of these men of the great war, except to remind us younger men that we should be held thrice shamed if we do not remember to do well so that you may feel that our homage to your memory is not simply coming from the mouth, but from the hearts. I am not preaching the, go I am not preaching the gospel of work. You made your standard of work as well as your standard of play. But let me say just this, play when you play, but don't play when you work. I am glad to see any harmless enjoyment from which anyone can derive a benefit. Only don't let it interfere in doing each his or her duty as the chance comes. As I have passed through Iowa today, I have been struck with the soil, the climate, the rich farms, the prosperity and happiness of the towns and cities, and by the high average of citizenship, which is noticeable everywhere. It has been my pleasure in the country districts to notice how the electric cars, the telephones, and the rural free delivery have joined to make the life of the farm less weary and to bring it more upon an equitable plane with the pleasures and the conveniences of the city. I admire the people and I congratulate them upon their crops and their products. I think the thing that has pleased me most, with the possible exception of the meeting of the old veterans, is the representation from the other end of the line, the children. I congratulate you upon all your crops and especially upon your crop of children. They are certainly all right in quality, and they seem to be all right in quantity. I like your stock, and I am glad it is not dying out. Now I will detain you no longer. I have only come to say that I believe in you, believe in you heart and soul, and that I wish for you in the future a greater measure of prosperity and happiness than you have enjoyed in the past. And now I bid you good night. Well. A little bit of a stem winder, all of those speeches, and probably only a fraction, actually, of the whistle-stop speeches that Theodore Roosevelt gave that day. He, he would, later in life, uh, on tour, uh, have throat treatments, uh, would have a, uh, a strained voice uh, from, remember, no uh, microphones, no uh, teleprompters, no speakers. It was shouting out in that uh, outdoor public or oration. Thanks for letting me shout out uh, to all of you and to the good people of Iowa. 
I've greatly enjoyed my opportunities to uh, perform in Iowa. We'll do so in September at the Clay County Fair. Uh, this is a benefit for the Theodore Roosevelt Association of Oyster Bay, Long Island. But we're going to uh, get busy getting uh, back to work here in Medora, getting ready for your visit uh, sometime this summer or fall. Stay well, be well. We'll see you through the week here on Teddy Talks. All the best.